allow me to shortly, briefly introduce our next speaker. He's a lead designer at 11-Bit Studios. He's currently working his PhD researching emotional human-computer interaction, design thinking and agile management expert on a quest, as he, and as he explains himself, to explore the art and science of meaningful experiences. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce to the stage Mr. Jakub Stokowski from 11-Bit Studios. Jakub, the stage is yours. Hello. Am I on? Yeah, I'm on. Hello. So, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I think there's not very much to add here. So, I'll just briefly restate here. I'm Kuba Stokowski. It's a pleasure, pleasure to, be on, uh, to be on the stage and talk to you about meaningful experiences. Uh, actually, the, why, why, why such a topic? I, I mean, this is a pretty, you, you could say that this is a pretty uh, high level stuff like meaning uh, and values. Uh, and we talk about games, and what, what we usually talk about when designing games is the mechanics, dynamics, and you know, how to basically use, the, use and utilize the building blocks that we know and love to engineer experiences, right? But when we are engineering experiences, then you know, naturally, uh, when they happen in the players' minds, they actually are more than just you know, uh, some of their parts. They are, um, uh, they, um, uh, they are based off of uh, the, uh, the player's self-concept. They are based off of the player's cognitive background. And this is actually what I'd like to talk to you about today, and I feel mildly uh, competent uh, because of the second part here, as I'm the lead designer of uh, Frostpunk that's currently, uh, currently in development at 11 bit Studios, but I'm also a, P a PhD in the making, researching psychology and human-computer interaction. So what I'd like you today to talk to you about today is uh, actually a mix of two worlds, a bit of science and a bit of art, um, with different you know, emphasis on, on, um, uh, throughout the talk. Because I feel that there is a, you know, basically to talk about games only about, uh, talking only about one or the other part is basically missing the whole picture. And I like, uh, you know, whole pictures. So, fair warning, this will get pretty high level at times. And we will, uh, you know, fly off even in the realms of stuff like uh, philosophy. So I apologize in advance. But bear with me, maybe there's something that will, you know, you'll find interesting and useful in your daily practice. Okay, so since you know, we started from philosophy, then let's ask the, ask the big question, why do we play games? Why do we play games? Why do you play games? Fun? Yeah, okay, that's one obvious answer. Anything else? Money, yeah, oh, that's, I haven't heard that one, but yeah, that's true. Challenge, uh, the feeling of power, uh, escapism, maybe. Right, feeling to be uh, the, the feeling of being in another world, influencing stuff that's you know um, that's important to us, yet, and yet it doesn't exist, right? And actually, when we ask this question, why do we uh, play games? It's not you know only we that that ask this question. There's actually a lot of people, very smart ones, that you know ask this question uh, routinely because it's a routinely hard question to answer in the whole. Uh, what you're seeing here is a meta-analysis done by Juno Hamari and uh, Janet Nanen uh, on different concepts and models of player motivations and player skills and, you know, what basically why they are playing games. And you see stuff, you know, originating all the way from Bartle and, you know, the, the traditional four player types through uh, Nicole Lazaro, Wang Chang, uh, Ip Jacobs, William Z, all the way up to Bart Stewart, uh, you know, trying the unified model, um, to bring the unified model. And what they do here is they look at the common themes among all of these different researchers. And you know, they identified some of them. Some of them appear in nearly uh, everyone, and some of them not so much. And you know, basically, the, uh, uh, the conclusion is that you know, all, even though there is some common uh, ground in all of these concepts, it's not really that easy to find the answer to the question, why do we play games? And in my uh, absolutely barbaric attempt, uh, I'll try to simplify it, in a way, in a statement that we use our brain and doing that successfully feels nice. And this is an, a statement that's you know, grounded in, in evolution, actually, right? Because this is a very evolutionary-minded question. We have our brains, they are, you know, they're given to us through evolution, uh, and using them effectively was the difference between, you know, uh, giving uh, our genes forward and basically dying somewhere in the savanna. But this is a really blanket, a very really high-level statement. It's not really useful. So let's go at slightly lower level uh, and say that we exercise cognitive skills 
and doing that successfully feels nice. Basically, the rationale is the same. Using cognitive skills is basically evolutionary um, uh, required to, um, to, to be successful. Uh, but this is, uh, and this is why it feels nice. But okay, this probably is not enough, again, to, uh, to take action on. So cognitive what? This is as sciencey as psychology gets. So bear with me, this is not you know, exact science of mathematics and proofs. But this is, you know, some really um, concrete experimental stuff that's been derived from multiple types of research on basically different ways uh, the human mind performs in the real world. So we've got stuff like perception. Do we notice things around us uh, and can we make sense of it? Uh, are we able to focus our attention for long enough uh, to be successful at our tasks? Uh, do we have the memory necessary to operate efficiently, both long-term memory and the short-term memory? Um, do we have the necessary motor skills to run away from lions uh, or type on the computer today? Uh, are, do we have enough knowledge of language uh, and competence in language to successfully communicate our desires and goals among other human beings, uh, and maybe not only human beings? Do we have visual, visual and spatial reasoning skills to be able to operate uh, successfully in the world? Can we, uh, uh, and you know, there's a little sloth of, uh, sloth of uh, executive, ex executive skills, so-called, like flexibility. Are we able to switch tasks efficiently? Are we able to formulate a working theory of mind, both our own, why do we do the things we do, what do we feel, why do we feel it, what is it that we want, and both of the others? Can we empathize with them? Um, uh, do we know what they want? Uh, do we want to do what they want, etc., etc.? Can we anticipate events based off of now our knowledge and, uh, and what we think and what we know about the world? Are we able to solve problems and make decisions, uh, which is a very, very crucial skill? Uh, are we able to rein in our emotional, uh, emotions and thoughts uh, if, uh, efficiently enough to be able to progress with our goals uh, and, and, and to, uh, to do what we want to do in the world? And are we, be, are we able to decompose the complex problems that the world throws at us uh, at each and every curve uh, into smaller chunks to be able to be more manageable and, and more actionable, actionable? So this is, by, by no means, is, a, this is, is, is it a com uh, complete list, but it's you know, high level enough uh, and complete at the same enough for our purposes here of this talk to, uh, to proceed uh, forward on top of it. But cognitive skills is not enough, right? When you talk about interacting with artifacts such as films, uh, uh, stories, uh, books, poems, and games, uh, cognitive skills is not enough. We use our cognitive skills all the time, doing everything basically that we do, and meaning what is important to us and what we use to actualize our own view of the world, our own you know, uh, emotions and, um, uh, and outlook, is based off of the context uh, of what we are inter interacting with. And that context is both ourselves what we believe and what we think, and the content. So what the content is actually showing us. So it's what we read in a book, what we see in a, in a movie, and what we see and what we do in a game. All right, so since we've basically said that you know, cognitive skills is the basic, uh, cognitive abilities is the basis for all human activity, then is it, uh, are games different from other meaning-bearing media uh, and our, uh, other meaning-bearing activities? And are they really that different? So let's reduce it. So the usual argument goes like this. Okay, so you know, we've seen movies, we've seen, uh, we've seen books, but games are interactive, right? You do stuff. You don't do stuff when you read a book. Um, but is that right? Have you seen Inception? Have you ever wondered whether that peg top actually fell at the end? And if you, know, if you thought that, yeah, it fell, then what that means for the story? Or if it didn't fell, uh, fall, then you know, what that means for the story uh, that you've just seen and what it possibly means for the characters uh, uh, going forward. Do you think that these guys just watch at the pretty colors? Yeah, well, obviously they do, to some extent, but uh, most of them usually do some time, uh, type of uh, operations in their minds, trying to make sense of what they're seeing, maybe construct stories and construct meaning. Is Decker the replicant? This, you know, spawned decades, literally decades of, uh, of, uh, of speculation and theories based off of, you know, just ambiguous uh, data that was presented in the original material. And that mental navigation that you do 
when you are interacting with, with content like that is interaction. It's just not manual, right? You're using your cognitive skills to basically operate in that environment. You're just not, you're just not using the motor skills. Sure, you do that in games, but it's not you know, all, all you do in games. There's actually a, a game scholar and designer, Brian Upton, who's actually around here somewhere in, in, in digital, digital Dragons, so I'll advertise him to you to you know, jump him and talk about this stuff because it's super interesting. Uh, he constructed an uh, idea of game face space where all of possible game states and a player and goal are placed you know, in, one, in one space. And what happens during gameplay is the player has some type of mental model uh, of the face space and what he can do, which is called the horizon of possibility. Uh, with the, and this is what actually is possible inside the game at this point where the player is at. This is all the stuff that's being governed by rules, mechanics, dynamics, you know, stuff that the game lets you do at this point. But this is not the whole story, obviously, because the player has its own mental model of what's happening. It's his own horizon of intent of what he wants to do in that given situation. The, and these two horizons are not really always compatible, right? In, in fact, usually they are not compatible. And what the player does before making a you know, visible action on screen is actually searching this face space to see where he wants to go, what he, where he can go, and where is the optimal path to actually reach this you know, arbitrarily defined space uh, uh, in, the, in the face space that we call a goal. Uh, do these guys around the players here just sit there for fun and to keep them company? In their minds, there's a whole game going on. You shouldn't do that. You, he'll checkmate you uh, if you do that move in, in three moves, right? Are these guys just sitting there for fun to look at flashing lights? Obviously not. All of them know the game, League of Legends in this case, I think, uh, and they play it with the, with the teams, sometimes even more intensely than the players in te themselves, just on a different level, using different, uh, different cognitive skill set. So anticipatory play is gameplay. That's Brian Upton's statement, and I agree 100% uh, with it. Uh, and actually, if we look at that uh, this way, a series of interesting choices, the famous definition by Sid Meier, could actually be used to lots of other media and not lots of other content. When he makes a series of interesting choices, and whether they are interesting or not is actually defined by the content that we see. Okay, so uh, that's all fine and dandy, and extreme reductionism is really fun, but it, you know, is it really useful? Uh, because games, obviously, when I talk to you like that, you might agree, you might not, not agree with me, uh, with me, but games obviously do focus on some of the cognitive skills exceptionally well. So let's see. What does player, playing a game from a cognitive standpoint look like? Do we use perception? Well, obviously, yes, right? You have to make notice of what's going on in the game. You have to be attentive to what's happening to be able to make choices. Uh, you have to use your memory, especially in a more complicated game when you have to memorize strategies and stuff like that. Uh, you have to use your motor skills. Uh, virtually every video game requires you to use your motor skills to a smaller or larger extent. Um, and this is more evident if you tell you know, people of age to try and play a, even a simple game, right? The, the you know, proficiency in motor skills is immediately evident when you, you, when you sit a person like that in front of the computer. Do we use language, our competence of language? Well, some games may be yes, but it's not really that, you know, that common and that, uh, that uh, dominant skill that we use in games. But we definitely use visual and spatial reasoning. Uh, we use flexibility to adapt uh, in, in games, especially competitive games. Do we use theory of the mind? Not really. I mean, sometimes maybe, especially in multiplayer games, some of that co competence is present there, but it's not really uh, you know, again, it's not a dominant. But we definitely need to anticipate. Uh, we need to solve problems and make decisions. We need to rein in our emotions, you know, at least until the end of the game when we throw the controller at the, at the screen. Uh, and we need to break down our tasks into smaller, more manageable chunks. So that's playing a game. So let's see how uh, reading a poem looks like. Do we need perception? We're in the technical sense, we are really reading letters, so we do need perception, but it's, you know, it's not a point of challenge here. Do we need attention? Well, yes, especially more uh, you know, advanced poetry requires you to be really attentive to what's, what's happening on the, uh, on the page. Uh, also using memory, where you know, some of the stuff you can't really interpret without knowledge of, say, you know, the author's life. 
Do we need motor skills? Yeah, to turn the page, but you know, we can go on. Uh, but we need competence of language, definitely, right? And you know, this competence is huge uh, in an experience like reading a poem. Uh, visual and spatial reasoning is not really a factor. Flexibility, you know, maybe to some extent to you know compare different different interpretations, but you know, it's not really a major focus either. Theory of the mind, yeah. Yeah, we have to empathize. We have to be able to construct, you know, a working theory of the mind of, you know, what's happening on the page and also of the author, etc. Anticipation, again, not so much problem solving in the sense of solving a problem of interpretation. We need the skill, right? But it's not, you know, the same skill that we use in games. Emotional self-regulation is not really a factor in sequencing. If it's, you know, the interpretation task is really difficult, then yeah, we need sequencing as well. So, the takeaway from that is that different subsets of cognitive skills amount to different kinds of emotions uh, in interaction, right? We, even though we use the same basis of cognitive skills when reading a book, reading a poem, and playing a game, obviously the experience is different. I mean, I won't try to convince you otherwise. So how is it different? We need another smart person to help us here. Uh, Don Norman, who you maybe have heard about, the author of the seminal uh, The Design of Everyday Things, the book that defined usability as it is known today, more or less, wrote another book on emotional design uh, and how, we feel, why, how objects uh, we interact with make us feel. And basically what he did is he defined three layers of, uh, of feedback, three la layers of, pre of pleasure, and, ex and uh, three, three, three layers of human experience when interacting with, uh, with, um, uh, with objects. The first level is visceral. That's the immediate reaction we have when we look at the object, we feel it, we feel the texture. This is the pleasure or lack of thereof when we see and interact with the object itself uh, from the visual and, and, and immediate standpoint. The second level is behavioral, right? How the thing performs. Is it usable? Can I master it? Can I use it efficiently? These are all the questions that make up the pleasure or lack of thereof uh, on the behavioral uh, level. And the third level, reflective. That's the deep shit, you know? How it makes us feel, uh, how it, you know, uh, resonates with us in terms of our worldview uh, and our, you know, uh, all of the big questions that we ask. And he famously, you know, showcased this on, a, on the three teapots. The first one is the beautiful, you know, glass one when you can pour the hot water in, you can see the, uh, the tea um, uh, being brewed and, you know, it's all so beautiful, but when you try to pick it up, you burn yourself immediately and when you try to pour it, everything is, you know, suddenly in tea. So it's not really usable, but it's definitely beautiful to look at. The second teapot is the so-called uh, uh, smart teapot. It's one when you, you can see that it's brewing when it's, you know, placed like that. Uh, when, if, you if you want to load it with, uh, with tea, you have to actually put it on the side and then the, uh, the cover uh, goes out and it's, you know, it's all very smart and very fun to use. Uh, but it's not really a good looking teapot and it's not something that you could, you know, showcase to people otherwise, uh, uh, apart from, you know, telling and showing how it works, right? And the third teapot, my favorite, is the so-called teapot for masochists. If you try to pour some hot water with it, you, you basically get burned. And it's not, you know, it's not something that looks nice, it's not something that's usable at all, but what a story it tells, right? Just you know, give, give it to your guests, it'll be all fun, or not. But how do these layers work with, game, uh, with games? Because, you know, you obviously interact with games and this should work for games as well, right? Well, you have to take a step back. Uh, another, you know, just a quick primer because probably all of you know your stuff uh, here. Uh, Game Mechanics and Dynamics 101 taken from Brenda Romero, who is also somewhere around here on, in Digital Dragons, so yay. Uh, um, uh, primer on how we construct games. What are the building blocks from, a, you know, the usual design standpoint. So we've got Twitch skills, the dexterity, hand-eye coordination, reflexes, stuff like that. Uh, that we use to construct dynamics such as speed, timing, precision, avoidance, time pressure, all of the good stuff. On the other hand, you've got strategic gameplay, right? Planning, exec uh, executing, analysis, trade-offs, dilemmas, all of the stuff that you have to put your brain to uh, in order to, uh, you know, exploit dynamics such as trading, negotiating, limited actions, choices, risk, reward, trade-offs, and et cetera, right? And obviously, this is a spectrum, right? So there are not, you know, it's not just a game of one type or the other. On the one hand, we've got games uh, that focus solely on the Twitch end of the scale, 
but then going uh, more to the right, we've got you know, StarCraft, Call of Duty. This War of Mine is somewhere around here, as well since it's a time management, management game. Frostpunk will be somewhere around here when it's out, but I can't you know, discuss it too much. The Sims, at the strategic scale, we've got you know, stuff like Civilization, Hearts of Iron, all the hardcore things that you really pl basically play with a, you know, uh, while doing something else, but all the gameplay goes, goes here, right? That's cool, but where is the, re the rester, right? I mean, some of you maybe uh, you know, uh, ask this question because maybe you make these, these types of games or maybe you hate them with a passion, but they are definitely there, right? They are successful games, successful products that are out there and have lots of, lots of fans. So these are D-Rester, To The Moon, Gone Home, Firewatch, stuff that's you know, not on this traditional Twitch to strategic scale. Um, so let's see where is D-Rester. Playing a game versus reading a poem. How does it compare uh, when we look at the cognitive skills? Well, ev obviously we've got a difference uh, between uh, requirements of perception uh, and motor skills uh, on the, in terms of language as well, but on the side of the poem. Uh, the poem usually requires us to, uh, to, ex to, co to have higher competence of language than games. Visual and spatial reasoning, same. Flexibility as well. Theory of mind. Uh, anticipation and emotional self-regulation. So in terms of, you know, we all use these skills, but the demands and the accents are placed very differently. But then, how does playing d rester compares to reading a poem? Well, we've got the obvious difference of perception. We move around in 3D space uh, in a game like that. Uh, and since we do that, we require motor skills to be able to basically just, you know, go around collecting stuff and we need visual and spatial reasoning. But apart from that, the experience is remarkably similar. You interact with content and what's the gameplay goes on in your mind when you're looking at, uh, you know, you're reading the, 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 uh, uh, the, the notes, right? You're constructing in your mental game what happened in this space, you know, how is that relevant? So it turns out, uh, hopefully I won't get flamed for that, but playing the rester is more like reading a poem than playing a game, right? In the, sen in the cognitive sense, right? The, in terms of demands of the cognitive system that's, that's placed on us. Uh, and it's, you know, I still think the rester is a game, and I, you know, what I really think is that, you know, descriptive definitions aren't that really useful uh, in terms of discussing game design, so functional definitions it is. Okay, so coming back, how does that uh, compare emotional, uh, emotional feedback, emotional um, uh, uh, design to gameplay. So on the visceral level, you probably guessed it by now, is, probably, is, is stuff like Twitch challenges, right? Where you have to, the basic feedback is a, is a really tight loop of low level interaction and what's, you know, the, the pleasures and the emotions that stem from this experience are mostly, uh, mostly visceral. The behavioral level are more the domain of strategic challenges, right? Where you have to, make, uh, master a system, you have to formulate strategies and make sure they work and, you know, it's all, uh, and, uh, and it's stuff like, uh, stuff like that are on the level of behavioral, uh, behavioral feedback. But what's on the level of reflective feedback? Any ideas? Not too many, and I didn't have too many myself, so I dug deeper. Um, because there are media, and they are there are experiences that focus almost exclusively on the reflective level. Like, like this, reading a poem, like reading a book, maybe to some extent, you know, watching uh, uh, Swedish dramas uh, in television, but in general, story. And I don't mean story in the sense of any particular implementation of story, I mean story in general. Those stories that are with us since, you know, we were in caves and basically describing to ourselves how to not get killed by a, uh, by a tiger, right? And it turns out that story basically has, all stories have basically very similar structure. There is an inciting incident that launches the protagonist on a quest uh, with an conscious or unconscious desire that ends in a climax. Through a series of, you know, increasing stakes uh, from scene to scene to a climax that, you know, then the, the, the stakes slightly fall, over, uh, fall off, uh, only to just rise even higher, and it all ends with a crisis that gets resolved uh, somewhere along the line. But the funny thing about stories is, you know, all of this you probably know as well, the funny thing about stories is they are really like cold flowers. 
In the sense, if you look really, really close, the same structure is present on each and every level. So if you look at the scene level, it's basically the same, right? You've got beats uh, that go on and on and on, uh, that culminate in a crisis, and it gets a re result in a climax. But the thing is, this is not really what's important about story structure. What is important about story structure is what's it about. And stories are really about conflict of values. It's love versus hate, mercy versus revenge, victory versus loss, life versus death. And if these values, these conflicts of values, are the, the heart of the story, then the heartbeat is the value reversal. How many times have you seen uh, and heard this, this story? A boy meets a girl, they like each other, but then, you know, he's so bearish, you know, she doesn't really want to go for a gruff guy like that. But then she starts to see something in him, uh, they get together, but then it turns out that he cheated, or he wasn't honest, and they break up, and she races to the airport. But then he sees the error of his ways, races after her to the airport, and, you know, all is forgiven, and they marry and live happily ever after, the end. Right? It's not a very good story, but you know, still it's a, it is a story, right? And what's, uh, what this story is about is these value reversals, not airports and any particular boy and a girl, right? This is a story of love and hate and relationships. Okay, that's fine, but games are not linear, right? We can't use the template of story to infuse meaning into our games. And yes, in a sense, but story have, stories have a structure, and an obvious one, right? You start with a beat, the smallest you know, very value reversal that happens in a story. They comprise scenes, scenes uh, con construct sequences, sequences construct acts, and these you know, amount to stories. And games also have a structure, only a very different kind, uh, a very different one. At the, ver the very lowest level, there's our core gameplay loop. Right? What we call the 20 seconds of fun. Throw a grenade, jump, and you know, uh, headshot, stuff like that. That's the visceral level of fun that we have when playing games. But then these loops form a bigger loop, the short-term goal. Right? Clear, the, clear, the, clear, clear the room, uh, close the sinkhole, you know, basically end the encounter. There's a mid-term goal, the complete the mission, which, you know, uh, amounts to a, uh, a long-term goal loop, that amounts to, and these loops form a game, right? And it's obviously, it's a very different implementation across different genres and different types of games. It's not the same uh, in a AAA shooter and, not, and, and an indie game focused on storytelling or exploration, but they're all there, right? They're the building blocks of game design. So my question is, why can't we design the values of gameplay in the same way we design mechanics? So the question that I posed, in the reflective level, I'd say that the challenge that we could give our players at this level is the challenge of human values. And we actually already do that. I mean, it's not possible to create a game, a rich game, you know, rich in, in visual uh, uh, feedback, rich in storytelling, and, and, and basically a lot of context, not to have values in it. It's just that we heavily reuse values again and again. How many games we've seen about life and death? How many games we've seen about victory or, uh, and defeat? And these are not bad values, they are just really, really overused. And there are games that do it slightly differently, at least, uh, and you know, this war of mine, in my opinion, is at least a, an example of it, because at the very you know, lowest level, it's still a resource and time man management game from a mechanical standpoint, but then you have situation like this, an elderly couple, you know, with medicine and you need the medicine, and will you steal from them? Basically, uh, making sure that they die, uh, or will you not steal from them and risk the life of you yourself or, you know, your flatmates? So that's mercy versus survival, a very different type of human value conflict. The Last of Us, famously in its ending, hopefully I won't spoil it for anyone, but okay, it's too late. Uh, you know, the, 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 the ending is a very heart-gripping uh, value reversal of honesty versus selfishness is just not done in gameplay, right? But it's something that, you know, I, I, know, I don't know a person who doesn't, you know, see it as something 
well, profound might be a big word, but you know, interesting and fun and you know, uh, somehow relevant to their experience. Human values are underused as a design tool. That's you know, my opinion uh, when looking at, um, at it from that, from that standpoint. So we could all, making our games today, it's regardless of what type of game we're making, we could look at our loops and ask ourselves what actions are we using and what values are you know, embedded in these actions. What core conflict is built on? Do we, and you know, ask ourselves, do we want these values? Because we, we might be making a game that's just basically, basically aimed at the visceral and the behavioral levels of, 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 of emotional design, right? And be content with that, and there's, make no mistake, there's nothing wrong with that. But maybe we want to ask something you know, from the third level, from the reflective layer. Maybe there are other values that we could embed in our game. So being conscious about values doesn't mean that suddenly everything has to be, you know, like all doom and gloom and, you know, asking questions about what is life and why we are here. Uh, there's lots of different human values that we could use. Uh, but thinking uh, about them could be used and utilized all the way from the concept stage. We routinely think about gameplay hooks and experience hooks when, you know, we think about our games. Why not think about values that we sell in the game? Because they will be there. Even if you don't design them, design them explicitly, they will be there. At the very least, we can be mindful, uh, and it's not that you know. Um, um, be mindful and be sure that we this is the type of experience that we want our players to experience. Uh, since I can't really talk about Frostpunk yet, I will sadly revert to this war of mine uh, and how it looks there. At the very lowest level of the core loop, there's this you know. It's basically a game about you know, scavenging, gathering resources and crafting, the basic survival loop that we, that we know from many other games. So it's having and not having, construction, basic needs, right? And, but on the short-term loop, the scavenge and coming back to shelter, we can see that it's ma about making do versus scarcity, right? And what can we trade off to make sure that we have enough to survive? Uh, as the mid-term loop, is about the higher level strategies like you know building rat traps enough to be self sufficient on, on, on food or you know curing Bruno or uh, you know so this basically a value conflict of being self sufficient versus being dependent and on the you know obviously on the long term loop and the and the, the game goal level this is about survival right the game is about survival versus death but then this is not really that you know different for many from many survival games but then the content of this game allowed for infusion of these, you know, these different types of uh, human value conflicts, like the mercy versus survival we talked about, or caring versus indifference when, you know, when, when, when you know, Bruno is basically sick. And will we save him? Do we need him? Do you start thinking about human life in terms of value, and is, it, is he useful enough to you know, try to save him? And this is why the game resonated on an emotional level with so many players, right? because of ask, asking questions like that. And of course, this process is you know, wildly iterative. You, can, you have a general idea of what you want to have in the game and general themes and, and, and values and emotions you want to have in the game, but you can't plan them all. Uh, actually, you know, the, 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 the elderly couple uh, scene in this world of mine came to be pretty late in development, but this is, you know, this is game design. I don't have to explain it to you. We design games that way. Thinking and designing values, con conflicts of values in our games will be exactly the same. May, my main point is that you know, there are many more human values than life versus death and victory versus defeat that we all use and reuse in our games. And I don't want to demonize them because you know, the visceral and the behavioral levels of emotional uh, experiences are, you know, can be profound enough for, uh, for uh, players to, uh, to, to feel fulfilled by them. It's obvious you know, when we see where games are today. But maybe that's not everything there is. Uh, each of these conflicts of values could fund a meaningful experience. And this is actually what I came to, to talk about to you, and this might sound you know, really high level, but what is really being meaningful? The, you know, the definition is being serious, important, and worthwhile, and I actually like the last uh, term very much, uh, being worthwhile, worth our time. Uh, it's because I really think that you know, it's, it's not about making you know, art and making people stare at the wall for 30 minutes trying to find meaning, right? It's not, it's not this type of... I don't want it to sound pretentious, right? But I do think that there is so much garbage in our life today 
that we as games designers making experiences for our players, players shouldn't be adding to it. Or maybe it's just because I believe in meaningful experiences and I'm just a, you know, I'm weird like that. Thank you. Okay, we are ready for the Q&A section. If you have any questions, just raise your hands. <coughs> Hi. Well, Hello. Almost died. Uh, <laughs> thank you for your talk. I have a question. Uh, going back to uh, this war of mine, um, who the player actually is in the game? That's a good question. Uh, oh, who do you think it is? Who do I think? Yeah. I don't know. God? <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat, yeah. I mean, the, the story that the, this war of mine tells can be you know, seen in a very different light depending on if you see yourself as one of the survivors or uh, God basically making decisions for them. But then you know, it still ex uh, lets you explain, um, uh, explore what this game is about from a different perspective, right? If you think yourself a God, then you can see that if you're a benevolent God or a God you know, that basically... Uh, treats people as resources and, 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 and making sure that you re reach the goal, right? But then if you role play one of the survivors, then you can test yourself if you're really willing to sacrifice stuff for other people and what you're willing to go to, uh, the lengths you're willing to go to, uh, to ensure survival, right? So I don't really see that, I don't really think that the game defines any uh, particular viewpoint and leaves it, leaves it, leaves it up to you. Hi, thanks for your talk. How much of this will we really see in Frostpunk? I mean, if the game turns, turns out bad, does it mean that all of it is bullshit? And does of it? course, <laughs> I'm being provocative right now. Well, uh, uh, but uh, I expect some interesting answer. So my, uh, my question, sorry, I'm, it's, not, it's rude to be replying with a question, but you know, <laughs> it's my question to you. Does it make sense, what I just showed you? Of course it does, but... Uh, uh, I need a proof to, yeah. to see it work. But actually, I think that oh, there's already proof. I mean, you've seen, it's not, you know, games that in their whole totality uh, see, you know, these value, uh, human value challenges at their core, you know, and, and, and this is what they're about. But we see games that, you know, use these types of dynamics. Well, This War of Mine was one example, and The Last of Us was another example. Uh, to ask interesting questions during gameplay. And it's just a matter, in my opinion, it's just a, uh, the matter of how deep are we willing to go in embedding uh, the values conflict in the game? Are we just staying on the themes level, right? What the story is about, for instance. This is really, it, it feels easy, right? To think about human values on the story level. But are we able to think about mechanics, the lowest level 20 second loops that are about, say, honesty, right, and or insincerity. And this is really the question, right? I, I imagine that to actually see it on the lowest level, there will be need to be some pretty, you know, heavy experimental indie stuff before we start to see it in, in the big budget productions because it's risky, right? But, but this is the type of uh, approach that we try to see in, in also in Frostbank. It's actually seeing, you know, these moments that are ripe for use when, you know, when, when talking about human values and, and these tough decisions uh, that we tell, basically make the player make. Right. If I may allow my, myself a follow-up question, because in this war of mine, most of it was present there, but done by intuition. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a... a guidelines, document, having all of it, or a similar theory. How much do you think we as, a, as an industry can gain from having a specified theory of making um, meaningful experiences? Well, that's a really tough question and one that's really uh, close to my heart because, uh, because of my background, right? I see myself as at least some percent scientist, right? Value, valuing theory and rational thought and, you know, proving that we know, that we know stuff that we know. But on the other hand, you know, making games is not, not science or at least not just science, right? It's art yeah. as well. Making intuitive decisions on the, in the design phase is bread and butter. Usually, actually, you know, in, a, in, in the heat of the project, you don't really have time for <laughs> proofs and stuff like that, right? You just go by the hunch and, 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 and your hunch as a creator, right? As an artist. 
say, to use the big word, right? So um, I think, but you know, coming back to the question, I think that theory is important in the sense that it feeds your unconscious mind. As long as you, you know, get to know theoretical uh, concepts and you know, gain knowledge, stuff that's not immediately usable, you still feed your head with it, right? And then when it comes to making these intuitive decisions as, an, as a designer, then you are richer for it, right? And, All right. And uh, I'm buying this, so you're basically training your intuition <laughs> Great. by learning all yeah. the theory, not to, oh, I remember that no, no, rule no. of something, something. Usually there's no time for that in a project. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> all right, thank you. Anyone else? Cool. Hey, uh, awesome talk. Um, just a small question. Mm -hmm. uh, everything you say relies uh, on, it, it's very interesting, but how do you battle the fact that games need to be fun? And because this is a constant necessity, and if you want to make a point, sometimes it requires sac sacrifice on that level. Where, well, where is the balance mm -hmm. between both, and can we sacrifice sometimes the fun in a core loop mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. emphasize a point? Well. Would you say this war of mine was fun? Yes. In the, in the lowest level, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah th but th this, is a, this is actually a, con the, 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 a topic that came up a lot when, you know, 11 bit Studios were promoting and, and talking about this war of mine is that the game is not, as a whole of the experience, is not really fun in the sense that you're living through pretty harrowing times and pretty harrowing story. But at the same time, what you're referring to, I think, uh, is actually the behavioral level of the core mechanics and the basic interactions. They have to be usable, they have to be pleasurable, pleasurable in and of themselves, but, uh, but the fact that it, they have to be that does not define what they are about. Mm -hmm. okay. At least that's what my intuition on theory would tell me right now, right? Okay, <laughs> thank, thank you. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, let me tell you that when you ask us if that this presentation made any sense, you're far too modest. <laughs> <laughs> because it obviously oh, does for anyone who has any touch with psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, this presentation ended very quickly, in fact, in a place that I expected you to begin. <laughs> so let me ask, because um, basically you're telling us about this uh, Jungian ceremony of opposites in values. Mm -hmm as a thing that you construct, something that you hope to be meaningful. My question is, uh, it's easy to make a crap game uh, and uh, throw a very robust and uh, conflict of, for example, life and death, and make mm -hmm. it a really, really cheap yeah. conflict. The values presented in a, in a way that's... Uh, Definitely not uh, reflective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And my question is, uh, uh, how do you, what are you trying to say? Are you trying to say that we should think about maybe uh, um, employing a different sets of values simultaneously? Or are you saying that we should somehow drive a recipro proportions of them? What is the next thought? In, in, in your train of thoughts about those. Let, 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 let me rephrase if I understood correct, correctly. You're saying that if we even take the overused life versus death value conflict in a game and we can really do it, uh, because this is a very powerful dynamic, right? But it can be done in a cheap way or maybe it's so overused that it's, no, it's not really done well. And how can we make sure that it's not being sold as a, uh, in a cheap way? Yeah, I think that would be the... Uh the more simple way to ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'd say that this is a similar, because how many uh, stories were to told about boy meets girl, right? That's, I mean, it's, it's pretty, s in fact, if you look at movies or, or books, then you could even make, try to make a statement that all stories are already told, right? We can only, you know, reuse them and tell them in new ways, but then, you know, the Robert McKee, who I've, you know, referenced for, uh, for this talk, is, uh, says that, you know, the, the story is a tool for making sense of the world. So we are always reimagining these stories to make sense of the, our current situation, our current world. So I'd say not to make an overly reused concept uh, and, and conflict of, say, life versus death, we'd have to make it, you know, ask a question how this particular conflict can be relevant to our target audience, right? 
it's not just about winning or losing, right? But how winning and losing can be relevant in terms of uh, what the game is about, what the audience expects, what, uh, what we can expect from the audience, uh, if, uh, and how can they react to the content that we're making. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, thanks for your talk, and um, it's a very interesting topic. Um, I couldn't, uh, you know, agree with you more. Uh, however, my question is, does it sell? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> I wouldn't really be trying to sell it if I didn't believe that this is the, uh, you know, w way of, of br bringing value to games, right? In the sense that, does it sell? Well, obviously, there is... There's lots of different, maybe shorter ways we could go to being a millionaire, right? Uh, but, but I think that if you present people with a story that's the conflict of values that they can come into interaction with and play with it, and they, through this conflict and through this inter interaction, you make them ask questions that are relevant to them. And, you know, hopefully at the end of the, of the line, it, it somehow enriches them as a human being, then I see it, that it will, they will feel that it is worthwhile and people fa uh, pay for value, right? And it will be of value to them. So I'd, I'd say yes, but I would also say that it, is, that it is difficult to do it properly, not to sell it cheap, etc. right? So it's probably not the easiest and shortest way uh, that we could take as creators, but, you know, there's, you know, this old phrase and uh, overused phrase as well of not, taking the short route, right? Thank you. Okay, um, I'd like to return to the topic of the contrast values. Where are you? Like very Sorry. much. And maybe, hey, it's here, it's here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, maybe I apply to my own project. Uh, I like the idea of adding the contrast values to every uh, grade of loop. But do you think it can be applied to every kind of game? Because it's easy to do if you have clear gameplay goals like this War of Mine, mm -hmm. StarCraft, or to any kind of linear story like Titanic movie. Yeah, uh -huh. It's easy. But uh, let's take uh, Gone Home. Mm -hmm. Do you think there are like, any contrasting values there? Well, yeah, actually, Gone Home, definitely. This is a, a story about, you know, uh, frankly, I can't really recall the specific beats right now, but what I came when I played the game, uh, is that, you know, this is a game about uh, relationship with parents, relationships with, uh, with siblings, with, you know, your, um, uh, your, uh, uh, your mates as well, but also uh, on nostalgia uh, and concepts like that, uh, that, you know, basically the sweet 90s and, and etc. But the core of the, of the story there is when, you know, the sister runs away it's, and, and stuff like that. It's, it's really about um, relationship uh, with their parents, and there is definitely a conflict there. I just can't really recall specific beats to illustrate, you know, what type of conflict is it. Okay, but do you think that maybe it's not important for this kind of game? I think Gone Home wouldn't be nearly as impactful as it was if, if it was not for the conflict of values. This was a game about story, and this story was about the conflict of values, uh, and if it wasn't, then it would be just, you know, just a walking simulator, right? Yeah, thank you. But, but it, it's definitely not for every game. Like, I can't imagine infusing super hexagon with, you know, some huge value conflicts, right? And it's not a bad thing, just to make myself clear. Okay, uh, thank you for your talk. I have a question about um, how um, the conflicts that you said uh, relate to choices that players make in the game? Is it just based on choices? Because you gave examples of like life versus death, mm -hmm. but in the game, the player doesn't really have a choice to choose death because then the, player, the game just resets him back to the start. Yeah. When other choices such as, you know, steal from the elderly or let them survive, mm -hmm. is more based about choice. So how does these two things relate? Well, I, that's a good, very good observation. I think that, yeah, some types of conflicts are essentially game-breaking in the sense that if, you, if you, you, the player chooses death, uh, then, you know, the game ends. But that's not, that, that's the fact that it ends the game does not preclude, or if, in fact, the opposite, it from being the source of the dramatic value 
in the game, right? If, if it was not for the game ending, then, you know, basically the choice of life or death would have to have meaning in a, on a different level, right? Uh, so, yeah. Do you think that meaning would be then more impactful if the player could choose death and something else would happen rather than... If it was done well, yeah, definitely. Okay, I mean, there's this, uh, there's this, I think it was Dragon Age, it came, you know, it stuck with my mind. There was this uh, urn of sac sacred ashes quest where the dragon was guarding the, the sanctuary. And basically that dragon had, you know, like a really great crafting ma materials. I think that you could use to craft the best uh, armor in the game, right? But at the same time, the situation was sold in a way that this dragon just basically lives there. It's not, you know, trying to eat anyone or, you know, make uh, the princess disappear and you, you and you know the crucial thing was you didn't have to fight him you could just go and complete complete your quest without fighting him and this is exactly what i'm talking about this is a question of life versus death when the player has a choice and there is a trade off there because if you don't kill him the kill him then then you don't get the best armor in the game but then you know if you do kill him then it tells you something about yourself right okay or, thank you at the very least of how you approach quests in rpg games one, one last question. One last question. Sorry. Okay, uh, I would like to ask you a question regarding the end of your speech, mm -hmm. because y you said that there is so much garbage in our lives that we as game designers shouldn't add to it. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is, um, games differ from movies and other medium. And if you watch a movie, you end the movie, you're left with emotions that, that were there. But while you're playing the game, in most of the games, you end the game in, in, in the midway somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, you save the game and you go away from your computer. Um, so my question is, should we make some design choices about dosing the emotions? And where, when should we stop? because not to add the garbage to the daily lives of, uh, of people. What, are, what is your opinion on that? Well, I, I definitely agree uh, that, uh, you know, there is... I mean, you know, the usual... It was a thing a couple of years back, right? Making, using behavioral psychology in free-to-play games design basically to exploit people. I think it's still a thing, right? I'm not making free-to-play games anymore. But, uh, you know, this is borderline unethical. And as game designers, I really do believe that we need to make it a con con conscious decision, whether we, you know, uh, how do we do it. But in terms of, you know, using these types of conflicts in the games, I think we are really not there yet to, tr to, to, to be making conscious decision on, you know, how to dose the experience. At least I'm not ready there yet. Because we, first we need to make sure that we control how we design these conflicts of values in the game itself, right? And then we, you know, th there's, the, there's the bigger question of how do we... Uh, design the portioning and the partitioning of the of the experience so that it's you know the most beneficial to the uh, to the uh, to the player. But it's a very valid question, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I would just like to add as an example the Undertale, mm -hmm. uh, the first playthrough. Well, when Flowey closes your game, actually, mm -hmm. and you're left with the emotions you have, and Super Brothers Sword and Sorcery. Well, mm -hmm. the episodes have have a small length and they're doses of the emotions. Yeah. So I think it's an yeah. important way to think about it. Yeah, That's, I, I agree 100%. Uh, hi, Hello. I have a question. Uh, this one of mine is about events, and the events cause the emotion. And we've got the tools to change the outcome of the emotion from the events. Mm -hmm. But do you think it's uh, possible to create a meaningful play just about designing tools, and the tools will create the events, not the uh, designers, but only tools. Right, so a Minecraft-type like mm, experience, yeah? yeah. Basically, okay. Um, yeah, I think, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> maybe, if, you know, it, it depends on what, what, what the content, what type of content you put in the game. It's actually, you know, black and white, maybe, is something along these lines, I don't know. You, you basically, you create stuff, but you're not, your actions are not, you know, uh, n neutral in terms of values, right? They, they, they are valued. But in terms of you know designing a game that that's about using value infused tools, well, I don't know. It seems like a challenge, a nice challenge, to do that. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Jakub Sokalski, big applause. Okay, before you all leave, uh, just remind, uh, let me remind you that we have an application which allows you to vote for your most favorite uh, speaker.